had to have that replaced. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So if you want to grab your Bible, highlighter, your cup of coffee, sit down and let us go through the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for just another beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercies that are fresh every morning, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that your thoughts were upon us through the night, Father, protecting us and putting a hedge of angels around our homes and around our families, Lord. May you be glorified in the things that we do today, Lord. Minister to us now as we get into your word. Give us uh, insight into the Apostle Paul's life and how he treated the Corinthians and instructed them to walk better with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul continues on from chapter 1 as he had changed his plans to come visit the Corinthians. Uh, Paul loved them very much and he was concerned about them. And so he wanted to come and visit them once again. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul says, But I, de I determine this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. Now, I just want to stop for a second there and just reread that first statement there. I determine this within myself. Now, we know the Apostle Paul was a prayer warrior. Definitely. You read some of the other epistles and he said, Pray without ceasing. And I continually pray for you. You know, pray for the brethren. So he was constantly talking about prayer, prayer, prayer. And Paul was a prayer warrior. But yet here he doesn't say the Lord determined uh, what he was going to do. He just says, I determined within myself. Now, I believe, <clears throat> I believe, and we're not, you know, we're human. We, we do make mistakes. But I believe that when you're in prayer, when you're seeking God, when you're a born-again believer, and especially when you're an apostle, apostle you're being led by the Holy Spirit constantly. God is leading you in natural ways. And so there are times when you have to make the decision. And I've just learned this, and I've learned it the hard way. And I've learned it through, through feeling guilt a lot because you can't always help someone. You can't always be there for someone else. And sometimes uh, they can make you feel like you should be there for them. And then you make the decision uh, to um, not help or not go or you know not do and you kind of feel bad like oh boy they really needed help but you determined in your own mind not to not to help and I believe that that can be God ministering and leading you because he really wants to do a work in the other party they need to really trust in God and not in man and and sometimes we get in the way of that <clears throat> now Paul says I determine within myself that's a natural way of saying basically look I, I'm making the choice on when I'm going to come again. And he goes on and says, I would not come again to you in sorrow. So I've determined in myself not to come again to you, but I don't want to come in sorrow when I, when I do come and decide to come. Pastor Chuck gives a great illustration of how God leads naturally. Uh, he said that his car needed a battery. And so he thought, I'd go to the junkyard and get a battery. It's a lot cheaper than buying a new battery. So he goes to the junkyard and he's walking around the, the junkyard. And all of a sudden he sees this gentleman that had uh, visited his church. And so they begin to talk. And it turns out the gentleman had backslidden, was going through some things. So Chuck started ministering to him and then eventually just prayed with him as they were walking out. And then they got into the cars and took off. And then he realized, I forgot the battery. You know, I forgot the battery I, that I went there for. But he said, sometimes God leads you in natural ways, puts you in positions and places so that you can end up ministering to someone else. So God leads in natural ways. And there are times when you have to make those decisions and you just have to trust in God. You can't feel guilty. Uh, you just have to trust God because God is the one that's in control. And he knew you'd make that decision, right? I mean, there's the foreknowledge of God. Well, what if I say yes? Well, then God knew you'd say yes. Well, what if I say no? God knew you'd say no. What if I hesitated and said, no, he knew you would do that, you know, because he knows all things. And God really ultimately is the provider of all of us. So he determined within himself, and I believe it's leading of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because it's written in the Bible. 
And the Bible's written by the Holy Spirit. So, verse 2, For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? Now, what does he mean by that? If I make you sorrowful, in other words, I'm going to share some tough things with you. And it's because I love you, and then you might become sorrowful because you might feel like I'm attacking you, you might feel like it's not fair, you might feel like you're picking on me, and, and that's a hard place to be. But Paul says, but then who's going to make me happy? Well, what makes me happy is when you receive it, and then you grow through it, and then I become happy, and my sorrow's taken away by it. That's what he's saying there. And I wrote... This very thing to you, that's to the Corinthians, least when I come or came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. I mean, obviously, some are going to receive and others will not receive. And the ones that don't receive, well, you know, they don't really add to our joy. And he's going to say it in a second here. They, they oftentimes add to our sorrows. And unfortunately, they don't understand and get it. And sometimes I don't either. But the things that we do cause sorrow to others. And not just others, but that sorrow can also spread to the whole church. And he, and he says that here in verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Now, there's a difference there, isn't it? When, when you see someone uh, toiling for you and helping you, and sometimes we just look at the fact, oh, they're sacrificing. Oh, they're toiling, they're sweating. Oh, that's nice of them. But we don't realize, no, it's because they love you that they're doing this. We miss that part of it because the next day they can say something to you and you're like, oh, look at how mean they are and how ugly they are and how short they are with me. When the day before they just revealed how they loved you how they gave to you, how they supported you, how they helped you, and so forth. And we miss that sometimes. Uh, people do things uh, for us, it's because they love us. And it's because God's Spirit is loving through them also. So don't feel grieved over it, but receive it as love. But, verse 5, if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. Um, this is something that you have to learn, not to be grieved. You make those decisions, and then you just leave it in the Lord's hands. People will try to manipulate you. People will try to make you feel guilty. People will rationalize, but you just have to say, Lord, they're in your hands. I can't, I can't change them. I can't change their lives. I can't change their situations. I can help if you're leading me to help, and that's wonderful, and that's great. But ultimately, you're going to be their provider. Uh, this guilt feeling and grief feeling you know, shouldn't be there. Do the best you can, you leave the rest to the Lord. Otherwise, man, you imagine the grief that would come on someone when they can't help everybody. That's a lot of grief. That's a lot of grief. I can't help this person, and then, then that person starts yelling, and then I can't help that person, that person. You got 10, 20 people now yelling at you, screaming, telling you, telling you things like, you don't love me, and, and God isn't there, and I'm gonna go back into the world, and the world is so much better. Well, go back. Peter says it's really great. It's like a dog going back to its vomit. That's mm -hmm. how great it is. So go ahead, try that. See how that works out. No, that's manipulation. That's manipulation when people do those things because they're trying to get something from you. And they're trying to grieve you. They're trying to make you feel guilty. And there are a lot of those people around. So you cannot take that personally. You just have to say, I'll pray for you, and you move on. Otherwise, you'll go crazy. You literally will. So... <clears throat> This punishment, verse 6, which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Now Paul here is talking about forgiveness. He says, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote, that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Uh, now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. The Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, 
when I came to Taurus to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Mesodania. Now, <clears throat> what was happening, and it doesn't say it clearly here, but most commentators will tell you he's making reference to 1 Corinthians. You remember the man that was sleeping with his father's uh, wife? Well, he told them to kick them out of the church and hopefully they repented, um, and they did, and now they wanted to come back to the church. And so Paul then is trying to get the Corinthians to receive them back. Look, this man has repented, he's asked for forgiveness, and so now you should forgive them as I have forgiven them. And if you don't forgive them, then you're not being Christ-like. You're not receiving them back into the body of Christ. And so you must receive them back, otherwise you bring greater sorrow, not just to yourselves and to Paul, but to the church itself, because it's great danger to live that way. Now, I think we can see one observation here is that these people repented. They repented, and so they were deserving of forgiveness. Forgiveness comes when you repent. The gospel message is this, that Jesus Christ came, was born of a Virgin Mary, walked among us, was crucified upon a cross, and on the third day he resurrected from the heaven. And if you believe that, you'll have eternal life. That's the gospel message. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel message. But God hasn't given everlasting life to everyone. You must believe in him. That means you have to make the choice by faith to believe it. And then God gives it to you by grace. And grace alone and nothing you do. You have to make the choice to ask for forgiveness. So God, will, God has forgiven and appropriated uh, the forgiveness of sin for the whole world. His death on the cross was sufficient for the whole world. Everybody can be forgiven. Is everyone forgiven and going to heaven? No, only those who ask, only those who surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. And in the Greek, <clears throat> when you read uh, John 3.16, it says, who continually believe in him shall not perish. And so it is a continual believing that is done by the Holy Spirit in your heart. You just won't let go of Christ. You will surrender your life to Christ. So now how can we apply some application there. <clears throat> well, when someone is seeking the Lord, they must forgive. I'm sorry, they must ask for forgiveness of their sins and God will forgive them and then receive them. Now, when it comes to our relationships, the same is true because you've mended your relationship with God. Now you need to mend your relationship with one another. How do you mend relationships? By asking for forgiveness. And so when you've done something wrong to someone, you need to ask them for forgiveness. And when you ask them for forgiveness, then you are restored. And that one person is to forgive you in that situation. But if you have not asked for forgiveness, then there's no forgiveness there uh, <clears throat> for you from God. There may be forgiveness from that person. He may have already forgiven you, and it's there because he has to live with himself. He can't be thinking and dwelling upon those things, and so... There's a point in his life as the one harmed and hurt that he has to just let it go and say, Lord, I forgive them. Even though they haven't asked, I forgive them. But they haven't received forgiveness yet until they literally come. Now, there's a parable where Jesus said, look, if you have ought or you have a situation with your brother, you shouldn't even be giving your offerings, your sacrifices. You shouldn't even be doing anything until you get that right because you might as well leave your, your gift and at the altar. It's, it's not doing a thing for you because you have a situation uh, in your relationship with someone else. That's a hard concept to grasp because people will go on and say, it's not my fault. And they'll get angry and they'll not really look at what they've done. And then they think, well, I'm doing good acts, so God must love me. And they'll just keep offering and offering. Well, God isn't respecting and honoring that offering. Not until you get right with your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. You have to. Now, why is that? Because Jesus said the number one commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? That's the number one commandment. We see that in the Old Testament, loving God first, the first five commandments, the next uh, first four commandments, the next six commandments are commandments towards men. Jesus summarized it in one sentence, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and thus you fulfill the whole law. So if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, if you're not forgiving your neighbor when they're 
when you've harmed them or asking for forgiveness when you harm them, then you're not loving, as J Jesus said, love one another as you love yourself. Now, there's a sense of humility there, isn't there? It, it, it takes a lot of humility to do something like that. It's, it takes a lot of chiseling away with humility at the pride that you have because you feel that you're so right. Being right doesn't necessarily mean you're right or it's divine at all. So we must forgive, and that's what Paul is trying to deal with the Corinthians here is forgive those people, receive them back into the body of Christ, and the Lord will begin to bless. And then he closes in verse 14 through 17. He says, Now thank be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. Is that true? Does Christ always lead us in triumph through Christ Jesus? Well, it's always through Christ Jesus that we're led in triumph. Triumph is not necessarily uh, victorious over our enemies. Triumph is not necessarily getting what we want. But we are triumph because if you look at beginning to end... And what our end is, we're triumph, aren't we? Because we have eternal life. Amen. And we have a home being made for us in heaven. And we're going to live and dwell and judge with Christ in the millennium reign. And then when the new heaven and earth come, we will live for eternity, forever and ever. So that's pretty triumphal if we keep that in mind. There's a lot of, lot of suffering in between that. When I was in cross country, we had to practice every day. I remember uh, becoming a freshman in high school. And I started running when I was in sixth grade. I, loved, I always loved running, very active. And so I thought I'd join cross country in sixth grade. And so I would run around the track and do things like that. Junior high running is different than high school. <clears throat> you usually just stay on the campus and run around in the, the dirt track. It wasn't anything fancy. <clears throat> but then when you get to high school, you have the fancy stuff. You have CIF, you have competition, you have other schools and, and so forth. And I remember going out for, for uh, cross country and we went to our first class, and the coach, Mr. Brown, introduced himself and says, we're the cross-country team right here. Go get suited up. Come out here. And we did a little bit of stretch, and he says, now give me 10 miles. Just like that, 10 miles. <laughs> and it was the hardest 10 miles you have ever done in your life. That first 10 miles is always hard. And by the end of the day, when you're all done, I went home, and my muscles were cramping, literally like cramping. I had to get up and like, ah, get some ice, move around. If I sat still, the muscles would start cramping. And then the next day we go to uh, class again. And here we are cross country, get suited up. Let's stress. Give me another 10 miles. Just like that. Now I say that to say this, <clears throat> that when you begin and when you end, the triumph is in the end when you win, when you place as a winner there. But the work is in the middle. The struggle is in the middle. And we're in the struggle phases, aren't we? We live on this earth and we're going to continue to struggle. That's just part of life. But we're triumph when you really think about it. We're triumphal in the very end when it is all over. We might have some muscle cramps here and there, but in the end we're triumph in Christ Jesus, by the way, not in our flesh, not in our strength. And through us diffuses or manifestations the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Wow. Can you imagine that? We're the fragrance of Christ to God. I don't wear cologne. I I can't remember the last time I wore, wore cologne. But recently, my mom and I were at Macy's and we were walking by the men's cologne shop and she goes, let's get you some cologne. I'm like, oh, mom, I don't need it. Oh, come on, come on. You know, She's at the age where she's telling me what to do now and she won't let me get out of it. So we stop and the guy's showing us all the different colognes and he's spraying me here and there and my mom's just going wild. You know, she goes, I like that one. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, that one's kind of, too harsh. I just almost want to start sneezing. I want something just very light, kind of misty. He's misty. What does that mean? I go, you need to have a billboard right here that describes fragrances so people can tell you what they're smelling. I mean, that would be a good idea. He goes, ah, I never thought of that. Yeah, well, 
you should do that. I think of misty, very, very smooth, doesn't just hit you, it's just very nice. And I finally found one. How much? $55 for a little wow. bottle of <clears throat> cologne. <clears throat> and so my mom sprayed it all over me and I'm walking around and I'm a fragrance to everybody, right? <laughs> Everybody's smelling me you know, as I'm walking around. Virginia can smell me. In fact, the clothes that I was wearing, I don't just wear a shirt and then throw it in the hamper. Uh, Virginia would be busy a lot in washing. I wore a shirt the day and then I put hang it up and I cycle it in my hangers so it goes to the end and then I just kind of, it works its way down as I'm wearing shirts. So I don't wear the same shirt, you know, two days in a row, which I think I did this Sunday. I think I wore that shirt two Sundays in a row, which I'm like, ah, oh, shouldn't have look, looked, but it's one of my favorite shirts and sometimes I will grab, grab it from another, another spot. <clears throat> But I was walking by my closet the other day and all of a sudden I smelled the fragrance of that cologne because it was on my shirt. <clears throat> can you imagine? We are fragrance to God. <clears throat> God literally can smell Jesus on us or not. Or not. <clears throat> if we are the prodigal son, what does he smell on us? Yeah, stink from the pig's pen. Right? If we get back into the world, what is he smelling? The vomit of us relicking like that dog going back to its own vomit. So we're either a fragrance or we're either pugnant, you know, to God. Now, I believe God's grace is so great that even when we're pugnant, he's reaching out his arms to us to draw us back because he loves us that much. But do you ever think about that? That you're a fragrance to God? And when you're doing good works, when you're serving Him and doing what makes Him happy, He's just like, oh, I just love smelling my people. You know, I just love it. Like some people love cologne. They just do. Randy loves cologne because I smell it. I can smell him a mile away. Here comes Randy. Because <clears throat> he loves his cologne. And he'll bring it and he sprays it all over him. Uh, he's in construction, so I get it. I get it why he, why he does that. So, and, and by the way, that brings up another point. We can't spray artificial fleshly fragrance, right, on us because God's smell is accurate. We can't live like the world and come to church and go, hallelujah, praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? And then we're living like the world out there. God knows because when he smells us, oh, oh, wait a minute, that's not right. Something's not right there. We have to be uh, spirit fragranced with the Lord, those who are not perishing. Verse 16, to the one we are aroma to death, to death, and the other the aroma of life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many peddling or adulterating for gain, that's what it, the word means, peddling, adulterating for gain. That's like Pimping for gain. That's what you're doing. <clears throat> the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God and in Christ. That fragrance comes because of Christ. It's not our fragrance. It's not our fragrance. I posted the other day that being born again is not a work of the flesh. And that's what some of us like to do. We think our walk with Christ is about our fleshly works. Uh, our livelihood is about our fleshly works. Our being born again is our work. No, it's a divine work. It's a work of the Holy Spirit outside of us that works in us because we're willing to ask God for it. And I probably should have went on and explained that um, all of us can become born again because God has forgiven us. And if we just ask and seek and knock, we will become born again. You just have to keep asking. You know, if, if you're seeking God and you confess your sins and surrender your life and then you realize, my life isn't changing, what's going on here? I'm still that same person. Then you need to get back to that altar and you need to, God, you need to help me be born again. I can't do this. I can pretend if you want me, but I don't want to. I want you to do it to me. So I'm back at the altar, Lord. Help me to be born again. Create in me that new creature through the Holy Spirit, Lord. And then if you walk and you still don't see a change, then get back to the altar. And you get back to the altar as many times as it takes and you cry and you beg God until you're born again. And when you're born again, you're not gonna have control over your change. That's the work of the Holy Spirit that changes you. When I got saved, 
I immediately had this hunger for the Word of God. That's not something that I created because I never picked up a book in my life. I would not read a newspaper on my own for the life of me. I just did not like reading. And all of a sudden I get saved and I look at that Bible and I open it up and I'm just like reading and it comes alive and I'm like enjoying it and it's, it, it's making me curious and it's teaching me and it's showing me things and I'm just like, I need more. And it's like I couldn't get my full of it. And within six months I read through the whole Bible. And then I wanted to do it again. And again, and then study more and study more and then look at the words and then look at the stories and then listen to all kinds of teachers. All, you know, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> that's not my work. That's not my work. And that's the work that is maintained by the Holy Spirit also. So it's not of us. Not of us. And by the way, just a side note, <clears throat> as uh, Paul said here, peddling the word of God. There were people that were peddling the word of God for gain. There are preachers today who peddle the word of God for gain. And may I tell you that Calvary Chapel is not one of those who peddle the word of God for gain. We are not <clears throat> a part of the group of men that call themselves preachers and they're preaching on prosperity and how God wants you wealthy, how God wants you healthy. That's an adulterated uh, prosperity. God in nowhere in the scriptures uh, has told us that every Christian is to be wealthy. Every Christian is to be healthy. The apostle Paul himself had a thorn in his side. Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Paul is going to say in <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 5, he says that we have no home. We're homeless. And so these are the apostles, and they're not wealthy like these so-called preachers today, the Cyrillo Dollars, the Crouches, the, the DuPonts, uh, you know, that all come out and say, you know, that God wants you wealthy. And if you just plant a $1,000 seed in our ministry, then you're going to be wealthy. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Now, I know I'm being a little dogmatic here, but Paul uses the word adulterated for gain. And so I want to be clear that Calvary Chapel doesn't do that. <clears throat> we don't preach a prosperity gospel. We just preach the gospel. We preach what Paul is teaching to the Corinthian church and what they're dealing with. And chances are we're dealing with the same things as we just went through this chapter and saw. Now, there is a place for prosperity, and that comes as God leads and guides. And if God has blessed you with prosperity, then you have a certain responsibility to share that with your brothers in Christ, to share that with the body of Christ. God has given you that gift, so use it for his glory like any other gift. But that prosperity doctrine, it's an adulterated, filthy gain. And they're ripping off older people, naive people, uh, and they're getting rich, living in mansions and flying around in jets and so forth, and that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous, and so that's a false doctrine. In fact, it's a heresy. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, anyone who preaches heresy will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are Paul's words, by the way, not mine. Look it up in chapter 5 of Galatians. So saying that and making some of you angry, I apologize, but read your Bible and I think you'll come to the same conclusion as we just did there in that one statement of Paul's. God bless you. Thank you for joining us in Devo 30. I pray that you will share this on your wall. You never know who might be uh, listening to it and get ministered to by. If you have any prayers, uh, please post them and I will pray for you following uh, this Devo. God bless you and have a wonderful day.